is the true mark of an agent of revival. Don't know God only as one who is able to deliver. You know him as one who will deliver. And then you know him as the one who may decide not to deliver you. But if he chooses not to deliver you, your confession is that we will not serve other gods. I will not bow. So as an agent of revival, your desire must be to know God. Your desire must be to get more and more of him. Your outcry must be, God, reveal yourself to me more and more. Hello out there. I thank God for this opportunity I have to bring us the word of God. I use this time to rejoice with our brethren over there in a North America uh, Conference of Evangelical Drama and Film Ministers, NASIDRAM. It's such an awesome one that we can come together to learn at the Master's feet and to fellowship with one another. Uh, please let us pray as we go into what God has for us today. Everlasting Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to learn at your feet again. Lord, I ask that as I open my mouth to bring forth your word, you fill my mouth with the depth of your revelation from an eye. Help me, Lord God, to reveal your mind alone. I pray that uh, these words will be straight from your mind and these words will find a bearing in our respective lives in the name of Jesus. Thank you, faithful Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Uh, the theme for our convention this year is Agents of Revival. And this is about what all the ministers will be speaking on, or most of the ministers, uh, depending on the angle from which God wants us to look at it. Uh, so I'll be approaching it from this angle, believing um, what God has on his mind for us. We get to each one of us in Jesus' name. Now, let's begin by asking this question. Uh, what or who is an agent? What or who is an agent? An agent is one who acts for or in place of another by authority from him. I equally have this definition. An agent is somebody who provides a particular service for another. And three, an agent is the means by which an effect or a result is produced. My first real understanding of that word agent uh, happened to be when I was studying what we called integrated science so many years back now. I think they call the subject basic science in Nigeria now. So my teacher taught us uh, agents of pollination and then he let us know that there are different ways by which pollen grains are transferred from one flower to another. And uh, this means are known as agency of pollination and we equally have agents of pollination. We got to know that butterflies or bees are parts of the agents of pollination because they carry pollen grains from one flower to another for the sake, I mean, for the uh, purpose of fertilizing such flowers. Then later I got to know there are agents of darkness. Most when I became born again, these ones are humans who help Satan to carry out his enterprise among humans. Then I got to know there are business agents. These ones are special workers who represent, speak for, and promote their workplace. They represent, speak for, or even promote their workplace. They are agents. We have agents of revival, just like we are considering in this uh, teaching. Agents of revival are believers who trigger and sustain the fire of revival wherever they are. So their duty is to trigger, that is to start off or sustain the fire of revival wherever they are. Now the question again is, what is revival? But let me reframe it. I think I prefer to look, it, look at it as what revival is not. What is revival? But it's better looked at for a better understanding as what revival is not. Now, let me give us two scenarios here. Number one, if you discover in a woman symptoms of morning sickness, 
uh, vomiting, nausea, or even you discover there is a slight weight gain in that woman. I believe you know that this do not necessarily point at pregnancy. Pregnancy is confirmed by a pregnancy test or a scan. Now, the second scenario is this. The screams of a pregnant woman in the labor room must not be mistaken for the cry of a newborn baby. What a screaming woman needs is prayers for her to deliver safely. What am I saying in essence? That not until the woman has brought forth and we see the baby, then we can't claim that the baby has been born. No matter how much the screaming of the woman sounds like the screams of a newborn baby, not until you see the baby, you can't claim that a baby has been born. So in, in the same vein, beloved, a big crowd, loud noise, razzmatazz, religious activity, spiritual busyness, bright colors, beautiful ambience, high-tech equipment, all these are not reliable pointers to revival. No, no, they are not. Unfortunately, in many Christian circles these days, these are being mistaken for true revival. So true revival is much more than an occurrence. It is actually an experience. If you don't get any other thing in this teaching, I beg you, please don't forget this. True revival is much more than an occurrence. It is actually an experience. Let me explain. What is an occurrence? An occurrence is said to be an event that happened. Whereas an experience is an event that you are involved in. So if the uh, event merely happens, then it's an occurrence. If you are not involved in it, then we can't say you are, you've experienced that event. Let's take this for example. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it is a scripture we know very well. There the Bible says, uh, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the world. Let's consider it by pausing a little here. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The key thing I want us to look at this point is the word after. So what comes afterward? What comes first here is the Holy Ghost coming upon you. So the descent of the Holy Ghost on the believer is in essence precisely an occurrence. When the Holy Ghost, when the Holy Ghost descended upon the disciples like cloven tongues of fire there in the upper room, what we see there is an occurrence. They receiving power after the descent of the Holy Ghost is what we call experience. So the Holy Ghost coming is an occurrence. They receiving power is the experience because each of them actually had an experience of the power coming upon them and then becoming witnesses unto him is uh, implying that they have become agents the occurrence again the descent of the holy ghost receiving power is the experience becoming witnesses is what actually makes them agents so by means of definition we can say revival is the following it is equally said to be revitalization, that is to give new life or energy to something. You can call it renewal, to return to doing something. You can call it restoration, that is to return something that was removed or abolished. Revival can equally be defined as reinforcement, that is to make something stronger. It can be called recovery. Recovery means to get back something that was previously lost. It can be called resumption. That is to continue something that has been stopped for a while. Revival can equally be said to be resurgence. That is to rise again. It can be called rebirth. That is to regenerate something that has died. Finally, revival can be said to be rehabilitation. That is to restore something to its former good condition. So spiritually, revival is said to be the awakening or quickening of God's people to their true nature and purpose. Let's come to agents of revival now. Agents of revival, by my own definition and my own understanding, are believers who trigger 
and sustain the fire of revival wherever they are. So if you trigger or sustain the fire of revival wherever you find yourself, then you are an agent of revival. Consider this. If you are in a dark room and you have there in the dark room with you a candle, you have a bush lamp, you have a lantern, candle, a bush lamp, the kind we use back home in Nigeria, and you have a lantern, and meanwhile, all you have is a matchbox that has an eight, only one match stick. So which of these will you light first? Think about it. Now, in most places where I post this question to the congregation, I discover that the people picked one of candle, bush lamp, or lantern. However, the correct answer is this. What is logically possible to do is to first light the match stick. Before you think of lighting one of the other three things, you light the match stick. That is the first thing. Thereafter, you can proceed to light any of the other things. So the lesson from this is that the match stick stands for you and it stands for me. Wherever we are talking of revival, the match stick stands for you and for me. We must be lit before we can light others. We must be revived before we can think of triggering revival in others. Unfortunately, what we have in Christendom today are many unrevived souls trying to revive others. Surely, you know, there will be a calamity. If not a calamity, we'll end up deceiving ourselves. So before you think of reviving others, you must first and foremost be revived. The individual must be revived before becoming an agent of revival. This is what I'm saying in essence. I love what the Bible says in Psalm 23, verse 5, the B part. There the Bible says, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Before the cup could run over, the cup must first and foremost be full. It must be anointed to overflowing. So what we are saying in essence, it is the overflowing measure that reaches every object around the cup. So meaning the cup is full, it is revived. So the revival overflows and reaches whatever is around it. That's what Christianity is all about. That is what true revival is all about. Beloved, your cup must be full, talking about revival, it must be over full before you become an agent that impacts the life of others. And then when you look at true revival, particularly the word Revival. R E V I V A L. You have R E V on one side, you have V A L on one side. What is in the middle? It is I. So, meaning I am in the middle of revival. So, essentially, the person that really matters here is you as an individual, me, and as an individual. So, if I am not revived, then I can never think of becoming an agent of revival. How do you identify an agent of revival? Number one, agents of revival stand before God before standing before men. Wow, amazing. They stand before God before standing before men. Who comes to mind here? None other than prophet Elijah. You know the Bible begins to talk about Elijah. When it opens with Elijah, the Tishbite, now we don't have any understanding of his background, where he came from, his father, his mother, his home. We don't know. All we know is that he was a Tishbite. And then we began to see dramatically powerful things about this man. Eventually, this man had to appear before Ahab, the king. We see that in verse 1 of chapter 17. There the Bible says, And Elijah... The Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand. That's the key thing here. Ha, the Lord God of Israel, before whom I stand. Then he went on to say, There shall be no dew nor rain this year, but according to my word. So for him to declare so boldly is to imply, and I believe rightly so, that he had been in the presence of God before coming to the presence of the king. And in verse 2, the Bible says, And the word of God 
came unto him, saying, so the word of the Lord in verse 2, simply sanctioned his own word in verse 1. Take note, he said, before whom I stand, there shall be no rain nor dew, but according to my word. Then the Bible says, verse 2, and the word of the Lord came unto him. Now, I think this appears like a reversal. The word of God must first and foremost must have come to him before declaring before the king. But he made a declaration. God merely sanctioned what he said. What qualified him for it? He had been in God's presence before coming to the presence of the king. So for you to be an agent of revival, you must be one who tarries in the presence of God. Beloved, if you don't tarry in the presence of God, you cannot carry the essence of God. Permit me to repeat it. If you don't tarry in the presence of God, you cannot carry the essence of God. And one of the essences we see in God is that his people might be revived. So you cannot be an agent of revival if you don't carry his presence. Psalm 91 verse 1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So it takes you dwelling in the secret place of the Most High for you to actually be an agent of revival. If you're still with me, can you say a big hallelujah? Let's go a step further. Number two, they stand out for righteousness. Agents of revival stand out for righteousness. Coming to our beloved prophet Elijah again, this time versus the prophets of Baal. It's an account you know very well. The prophets of Baal had tried their best to call their king, I mean their, their, their god, Baal, to save them from impending shame. They cried all day, but eventually when he got to the town of the prophet, you know, the prophet had to repair the altar. He gathered 12 stones. And what did he do with the 12 stones? He began to pour uh, buckets of water. Do I call it buckets? Uh, big containers of water. He kept turning them upon the stone. And the, the, the sacrifice, uh, the object of sacrifice on the stones. He made the thing become so wet. And then he began to speak to God. Study the scripture very well. At no point did Elijah call down fire. At no point. He was merely discussing with God when fire came. Because he was somebody who stood for righteousness. He said, let these people know that you are the God. You are Jehovah. You are the one who reigns amongst men. You are the true God. He was still discussing with God when fire came. Meaning fire did not delay. Because this was somebody who stood for righteousness. God did not wait for him to even call down fire before he sent down fire. So for you to carry the fire of revival, you must stand for righteousness. And the Bible makes me see in verse 39. Let me read what the uh, account is here. There the Bible says, And when all the people saw it, when they saw what? When they saw the fire. They fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is the God. That is worship unto Jehovah God. The same people who had doubted the reality of Jehovah God, now confessing with their faces to the ground, and they declared, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. A revival happened. Why? Somebody stood for righteousness. But what struck me here is the Bible saying, and when all the people saw it, what did they see? They did not only hear it, they saw it. They did not read about it, they saw it. So beloved, they didn't see just the fire. They saw beyond that. They saw a man that stood for righteousness. So righteousness is not just for declaration, it is for demonstration. If you claim you are righteous and we cannot see it, I beg to disagree with you. You are not truly righteous. So righteousness is not for declaration, it is for demonstration. They saw it in the life of Elijah and a revival took place. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, that they may see your good works again, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That means righteousness that cannot be seen is as good as useless. So for you to be an agent of revival, you must make a stand for righteousness and the righteousness must show. Number three, identity of an agent of revival. Agents of revival stand up while others bow for ungodliness. They stand 
while others bow from godliness. Matthew 4, 9 says, And see it unto him, all those things will I give thee, if thou wilt bow down, bow down and worship me. You know who spoke there? The devil, the adversary, our arch enemy. He spoke to our Lord Jesus here. He said unto him, All this will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. That is a big insult. Talking to the creator of the universe, that you give him everything. Uh -uh. The one who created everything, including Satan himself. When he was yet Lucifer, a glorious angel in heaven, now coming and telling him, I will give you everything. This is a matter for another day. Another day, time will not permit me to delve into this much more. I mean, so much. But in verse 10, our Lord Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and holy only him shall thou serve. We live in a generation where people now bow for things other than God. All manner of idols, people bow for money, people bow for materials, they bow for cars, they bow for pleasure, they bow for women, men, position, fame. People bow for things other than God. But if you want to be an agent of revival, what we are saying under this third point is that you stand while others bow for ungodliness. I'm sure you remember the account of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When the king Nebuchadnezzar set up an image of himself and told people to bow to the image, a report got to the king that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are flouting your order. Oh king, what are you going to do about them? The king so said to them, I want to believe that what the people said to me is a lie. So I'm giving you an oppo another opportunity. At the sound of the instruments, bow down before the image I've set up. But these people said to the king that we will not do it. The king said, I'm going to cast you into the burning fury furnace. I made the announcement before I told people to bow down. You heard it and you are telling me you are not going to bow down. I will cast you into the burning fury furnace. You will die. You just be wasted for nothing. But let us see what the Bible says in verse 17. Verse 16 begins with, We are not careful to answer you in this matter. That is, you don't need to think about the answer. We are not careful to answer you. We don't need to give you any special honor, O king, when it comes to answering you on this matter. We don't need to go and pray about it. We have an answer. We are not careful. And verse 17, they said to the king, If it be so, Ah, our God whom we serve, not our God whom we merely know, not our God whom we merely hear about, our God whom we hear about, whom we know, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O King. Great, the new God as the God who is able to deliver, the new God as the God who will deliver. But that was not the end of their knowledge of God. If it is on these two platforms that you know God, then, beloved, you may end up buying for things that are far less than God. The new God, as one who was able to deliver them, who will deliver them? And verse 18, they said, But if not, hmm, this is the peak of your knowledge of God. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods. This is the true mark of an agent of revival. You not, don't know God only as the one who is able to deliver. You know him as the one who will deliver. And then you know him as the one who may decide not to deliver you. But if he chooses not to deliver you from oppression, from depression, from any kind of satanic affliction, your confession is that we will not serve other gods. I will not bow. So as an agent of revival, you must be ready to dare every ungodly status quo. You must be ready to stand. We have stories of martyrs who stood for righteousness and they lost their lives. One case that comes to mind is that of a man known as Ignatius who lived between 35 to 107 AD. He was a close friend of John the Beloved, the same John we know in the Bible. And he was a bishop of Antioch. He confessed and he said that he preferred to die for Christ than to rule the world. He was thrown into a lion's den where he was eaten alive by lions. He knew God as a God who was able to deliver, that will deliver. 
and may choose not to deliver, and they stood his ground. Another one was John Knox. This man lived between 1369 and 1416. This man was charged to court without a lawyer to de defend him, and he was sentenced to death. He spent seven months in the prison before his, the execution order was carried out. He was eventually brought to the stakes to be burned alive. Before the fire landed on him, at the stakes where he was tied, Hey, John Knox made a declaration, and I quote him. He said, Out of the truth of the gospel which I have learned, which I have taught, and which I have preached, I die willingly and joyfully today. And as the fire began to move towards him on the stake, slowly, and they began to burn him gradually from the leg upwards, the man began to sing in anguish. And the song he sang was, Jesus, son of the living God. This was a man who was willing to stand. He refused to bow. To be an agent of revival, you must be willing to stand in the face of persecution, in the face of oppression. We can't go any further on this point, but then I will move quickly to point number four. Agents of revival stand the world on the right side. They stand the world on the right side. Remember the story of Paul and Silas? The Bible says they traveled through Amphipolis, they traveled through Apollonia, they landed in Thessalonica, and they began to expound the word of God unto the people of Thessalonica. There was a massive revival. And they lodged in the house of a man known as Jason. Jason was an inhabitant of uh, Thessalonica. So he gladly hosted them. So after every day to say every day's crusade, they returned to his house to sleep. There was an uproar in the land of Thessalonica because they saw what happened. They were so annoyed. They went to the house of Jason. I don't know what happened. They couldn't locate Paul and Silas on that occasion. What did they do? When they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come either also. These that have turned the world upside down, they have come to our land. Look at their expression. The people that have turned the world upside down, when indeed what Paul and Silas did was to turn, turn the world right side up as an agent of revival. You must be ready to correct every negative narrative. What is the prevalent immorality? What is the prevalent uh, laxity in your society? You must be willing to stand. Even in the church of God, what are the things that do not bring glory to God that you notice there? You will be willing to stand so you correct every negative narrative. And by so doing, you are turning the world on the right side. You are placing the world the right way it should be. So as an agent of revival, you must be like Paul and Silas. Wherever you go, there must be an uproar. Not violence, no. I'm not talking of disorderliness, no. I'm talking of an uproar of righteousness, an uproar of revival, an uproar of godliness, an uproar of the love for God, an uproar of passion for the kingdom, wherever you go. Are you a student? Where do you find yourself? On an higher institution? The school must know that somebody passed through that institution. Are you in a foreign land trying to make a living? You must, be, I mean, you must go beyond trying to make a living. You must let your life count for God because if it does not count for God, then you will not be, you not be counted on that day. You must not let your life make a meaning. People will be able to see of you that of a truth, you came here and you really made a landmark and you left a legacy. I pray this will be a portion in the name of Jesus. Number five out of six, they constantly stand in need of divine knowledge. Agents of revival are people who are constantly in need of divine knowledge. They want to know God more and more. Our beloved friend Saul, who eventually became Paul the Apostle, got converted on his way to uh, Damascus. You know, he was going to wreck a work against the body of Christ. He got converted in the year 33 AD. And then after his conversion, this man went on a lengthy retreat under uh, Ananias, at the time again, he went to the Arabian region. You can call it a theological college. You can call it a Bible college. You can call it school of discipleship, whatever it is. He went to know about God 
for a lengthy period of time. And then he wrote so many books, talking of uh, Paul the Apostle. But one book he wrote particularly was a book of Philippians, which he wrote in 64 AD. 64 AD, he got born again, 33 AD, 31 years in between. And when he wrote this book, he got to Philippians 3.10. That, uh, that is where he made this big declaration. Verse 10, he says, and I wonder, why would he make that declaration? Maybe some people came to him. Paul, you have been in Christ for so many years. Hey, people know you all over. You are doing great things for the kingdom of God. What is your greatest desire? What is your greatest hunger? What do you need the most now? I guess that was when he voiced out Philippians 3.10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So the greatest desire of Paul the Apostle, after many years of being in Christ, was to know him. So as an agent of revival, your desire must be to know God. Your desire must be to get more and more of him. Your outcry must be, God, reveal yourself to me more and more. The truth is that we can never know everything there is to know about God. We keep growing in knowledge of him, but we never come to the point where we know everything about God. Because the day you discover everything there is to know about God, God stops being God. And hallelujah, God can never stop being God. So he's still a mysterious being over there. But you seek to know him more and more. Paul cried that I may know him. He did not say that I may build the biggest cathedral. Big cathedrals are okay. They are great, wonderful. If God gives you the grace to build one. He did not cry, I want to ride the latest vehicle. No. He did not cry, I want to become the most popular servant of God in the land. No. He did not cry that I want to have the biggest congregation. No. Paul, what is your greatest desire? That I may know him. If you are truly an agent of revival, this should be your pursuit to know God more and more. I hope time will permit me to quickly share with you what happened some years back. I was traveling from Ilone, where I'm based, to a place known as Nubusa. In, uh, it, was, it used to be in Kwara State. I think it's now in Niger State. So on my way to that place for mission work, we drove across uh, Kainji Dam. That's the biggest dam in the country, supplying electricity, generating power for so many, I mean, for the country and even some other neighboring African countries. So I saw the dam on the right, so massive, we drove into Nubusa. On our way back, we drove across Kainji Dam again. This time it was on my left hand side, just after Kainji Dam. We got to the nearest village, I think known as Sabon Peggy. And when we got there, the Spirit of God began to tell me, look, look at something about this village. I looked, I didn't know what God wanted me to see. But I saw on the signpost in front of a shop in that village, the name Sabon Peggy. I knew it was Sabon Peggy. And then I discovered what God wanted me to see. I saw lying in the street of that village were electric poles. But there were no electric wires on the poles. And the Spirit of God told me, he said, son, see, the village nearest the source of power has no power. Wow, the thing shook me. The village nearest the source of power merely had a semblance of having power because of electric poles, but there were no wires. There was no electric power supply as at that time. So this is a state of a lot of Christians. We are in the body of Christ, we are in church, we identify with Nasidram, we identify with Ansidram, we identify with Khan, with PFN, we identify with brethren. Hey, we are there. But so many still do not know God. Or better put, the knowledge of God so many have is so shallow, not strong enough to make them become revived, not to talk of reviving others. So beloved, you must keep crying unto God, Lord, let me know you the more. Do everything you need to know God the more. And what is the cheapest way to know God? The Bible. Get close to the word of God. As a drama minister, don't merely pray unto God, give me another script, give me a revelation that will shake the world. What you need to do is to tarry in the place of study. And I discover when you tarry in the place of study, you'll never be sorry when you need a revelation because God will reveal his mind. Things you don't ask for, you keep depositing into your hand. And finally, Agents of revival, stand down 
for Christ's kingdom to stand up. They stand down for Christ's kingdom to stand up. Remember John the Baptist. What did he say? In John 3 verse 30, he said, He must increase, but I must decrease. He did not say, He may increase. And I, he said, He must. The Lord Jesus must increase, while I must decrease. So true agents of revival are people who don't seek to be known. They are just known. They don't make effort to belong. Hey, they just belong in the, in, the, in, the, in the caliber of world shakers. They are not out for popularity. Popularity just locates them. So their own case is that he might be known. They stand down so that Christ's kingdom can stand up. I'll be closing with an illustration. There was a man known as Emperor Oliver Cromwell. Emperor Oliver Cromwell. He was a ruler over the then commonwealth of England, Scotland, and Ireland. So these three cities or three kingdoms. He was the emperor over the three of them when they were still together as one. During this reign, something happened. And the thing shook the whole kingdom. Coins were running out of circulation because it was the legal tender then. That was what they used to transact businesses to trade. So they were running out of coins and they brought a report to Cromwell that we don't have silver to make more coins. Meanwhile, all the coins we know we have are running out of stock. In a short while, we'll not have a legal tender again. Go ruler, what do we do? He told them to look around the kingdom and look for silver by all means. They did. After days, they came back to the ruler, Cromwell. They said to him, we could not locate silver anywhere except in the temple, in the church auditorium. He said, what do you mean? Uh -uh. Do they extract silver in the temple? They said to him, we discovered that the statutes of the saints, that is Apostle Paul, Peter, James, John, all the saints, all the disciples, that they used pure silver to make the statues, to decorate the temple. And the king said, what are you saying? Silver to make saints. He said to them, let us melt the saints and put them into circulation. That is the saints are not for decoration, they are for confrontation. So we can't allow the saints to stand in the synagogue. No, bring them here, melt them. Make coins out of them and put them into circulation. So a lot of agents of revival have reduced themselves to mere decoration objects. You are there. I keep telling people in science, they taught, they taught me that matter is anything that has weight and occupies space. If it merely occupies space but has no weight, then it doesn't matter. So in the kingdom of God, if you merely occupy space, you are not exerting any weight wherever you are, then you don't matter. So don't stand in the synagogue like a saint that is merely for decoration. Your outcry as an agent of revival, your constant outcry should be, Lord, here am I, break me. Here am I, melt me. Here am I, mold me. Here am I, use me. So that's the outcry of true agents of revival. And this is a passing, I mean, parting shot in this teaching, constantly cry to God, Father, here am I. Please, Daddy, break me. Here am I, melt me. Here am I, mold me into what you want me to be. And the Lord, use me, send me, put me in circulation. Beloved, I sincerely thank God for giving us this opportunity to learn at his feet. I pray that these words will not fall to the ground, but that thing that they have triggered in our hearts will bear fruit. From henceforth, our lives become extraordinary on account of the one we carry within us. I pray wherever the souls of our feet step, there we take for a possession. I pray whatever we lay our hands on prospers even for God. That is my prayer for you and for myself. Once more, thank you so very much for listening. Can we bow our heads to speak to God in a moment? Pray that from henceforth, 
you begin to bear the true identities of an agent of revival. That wherever you step into, there will be a revival. So shall it be. Father, we return the glory to you for revealing your mind to us. Lord, I thank you for giving me utterance. Thank you for giving me the privilege to bring your word to this distinguished body of your children. Thank you for speaking to me first and foremost and to the entire house. I pray this word will not fall to the ground, but they achieve the purpose for which you sent them. Thank you so very much. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.